close enough. It's good. I don't believe it. It was a Sunday morning and we just were told we had a game and we took off in a couple of cars and went across town. We had on jackets and we pulled our jackets up over our head as we walked into the gym. Didn't realize it till we got in the gymnasium that here we were and we we're gonna play a black team. Some elements of the Klan was prevalent in Durham during that time. They had known that. Hmm. In the South, the laws on segregation were etched in stone. We thought that's the way it would be forever. The origins of the secret game of March 1944 are actually somewhat ambiguous. This was an illegal game in the state of North Carolina, and no one knows for sure how it was initiated. But the story goes, students from North Carolina College for Negroes would attend these clandestine meetings at the YMCA in Durham. And there would be students there, white students, of course, from Duke. One of the gentlemen from Duke boasted about their medical team. He said they were the best in the state if not even beyond the state of North Carolina. Another member of North Carolina College for Negroes says, well, you may be great, but you haven't played the greatest. And that's Coach McClendon's team. John B. McClendon would become a legend in basketball. At the time of the secret game, he was only 28 years old. But he was already revolutionizing the sport. He implemented an up-tempo style of play that dominated opponents. McClendon's players revered him. McClendon was my mentor. He gave us the four W's. Who are you? What are you? Why are you here on this earth? And where are you going? John wanted very much for his young people that he was working with to feel as good about themselves as they possibly could. There was a psychological impact, of course, of all this segregation. And you tended not to think of yourselves as quite equal. Even though you might profess to be, 
there was still that inside. He wanted his players to think that they were as good as any white player, and they should have the same opportunities. I met Coach McClendon in 1940. And when I arrived there, they called us to a meeting in the gymnasium. And they told us, don't go downtown, period. We knew the results of going to the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time. Into this atmosphere of rabid segregation, virulent segregation, McClendon played this secret game. It kept secret by all but those who were there pretty much for 50 years. Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, the game was scheduled when most of the people in Durham would be in church. Coach McLendon ordered all of the students out of the gym. So if anything were to happen, they wouldn't get hurt. Players from both teams were very, very nervous. Some of his players had never had any contact with whites before. Some of them had never touched a white person to shake hands even. It was an official game. They had two referees. There was a time clock, but there were no spectators. The first moments of the game, there were missed shots, turnovers. I think they just had to get the bugs out, and they obviously did. You could feel it coming. They had never, ever seen anybody run up and down the court like we did. Literally, they ran Duke's team out of, out of the gym. Those fellas just beat the heck out of us. They just crushed them. They crushed them. They beat the Duke team 88 to 44. Remember, this was an illegal game, and Coach McClendon was a young man. There is no doubt that he risked his professional life, and maybe even beyond that. History will never tell what they really did. It was just a ripple on the pond. But the fact is, the ripple came, and then pretty soon was a tidal wave. They had 15 children, I'm the 15th, which was good because it made life a lot, a lot easier. I didn't have to pick as much cotton as, as the rest of them. During the cotton picking season, the white kids went to school, um, but the black, you didn't go to school at all. I was one of 14 kids that my grandmother raised, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. I was in the cotton fields from eight years old on up. My father was killed when I was uh, uh, four months old. My mother died uh, when uh, at childbirth. Uh, my, I was reared by my grandmother. My father was educated to the first grade, went to work in the packing houses. My mother went as far as the eighth grade. They married and proceeded to have 13 children. 
eight of them reach maturity. We had an outhouse, and finally, by the time we get to, I get to eighth grade, uh, we had an indoor facility. I mean, that was a big moment. That was a great moment. You know, you, you know you didn't have a lot, but, I mean, you know, that's just kind of where, where life was. We laughed, we loved, we had fun and stuff. And that's, uh, that's basically all you really knew. All you really knew was your surroundings. I lived in a black world, black world. From kindergarten to college graduation, I never had a white classmate. I lived right behind this white high school and, of course, never could go to it. And so us colored kids watched through some bushes. In effect, what we were watching was the mainstream, white America. It was everybody else, and then there was us. I spent more time on the basketball court than the end of day. And I would have these dreams that I was playing against the greatest players, and I would actually lose myself in those dream games. As the senior prom ensued, and everybody was coming to the senior prom, I was the only one that, that wasn't there. I was on the court by myself. I would just play all day long. I would play till it got night. It got so dark sometimes, I couldn't even see the ball. I could only hear it. I could only hear it hit the goal. They laughed and went into the senior prom and had a good time. And probably about 11 or 12, when they came out, I was still there. In the 11th grade, uh, I decided that I was going to get wealthy. And uh, I wasn't going to get wealthy going to school every day. So I quit, and I started digging septic tanks. Got all a bit on the job, five minutes. <laughs> That's where I started thinking of college. My grandmother's point, I knew that, that if I was going to rise above that, I had to find a way to win a scholarship to college. I had to, I had to go to college. Well, historically, black colleges were created because blacks weren't allowed to attend historically white colleges. So if a black person wanted to pursue um, higher education, one had no choice. Education has always been a fundamental uh, desire on the part of, of African Americans. But during the period of slavery, in some areas, learning to read and write was the ban. These were people who had been treated like animals listed along with animals in the federal census. The reconstruction effort in the South after the Civil War included the creation of higher educational institutions for black people. By the turn of the century, 75 historically black colleges had been established. Many black people saw education as their salvation. This effort was led both privately by churches and publicly by state legislatures. The two most influential black thinkers of the day were W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Washington, an ex-slave, started Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in 1881. A state infested with Klansmen. Enough racial hatred to fill up a, a whole nation. And somehow he talks them into giving them some land to build a school for black kids. But he did it. Look at Washington. He asked me to come to Tuskegee and see what he was doing. I'm proud to come to Tuskegee because I'm proud of what Tuskegee has done, of the fine spirit of human service that your graduates carry with them throughout their lives. For decades to come, historically black